Welcome to Better System Trader, the podcast to help systematic traders of all levels improve their trading. We'll give you loads of expert tips and practical advice on system design and validation, money management, trading psychology, and many other topics. Whether you're just starting out or a savvy systematic trader, we're here to help you improve your trading and find more success. This is Better System Trader with your host, Andrew Swanscott. Hi there, welcome to Better System Trader. This is episode number 151. Glad you could join us today. Now today I want to start off with a Warren Buffett quote. There's plenty of Warren Buffett quotes out there on the internet. This one applies very nicely to the topic of this episode. And uh, the quote is, the stock market is a manic depressive. Now I'm sure we've all realized that the market can be full of euphoria and greed one moment and then switch to fear and panic the next. And this can often be a time of danger and high risk for some traders. But for other traders, it's a time of immense opportunity. How? Well, in this podcast episode, we're joined by special guest Larry Connors. Larry has over 30 years in the financial markets industry and has been featured on The Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg, Dow Jones, and many others. So it's really an honor to have him on the show today. Larry's been providing high quality data driven trading research for over 15 years now, and I'm sure that many Better System Trader listeners have a stack of his books on their bookshelf. I certainly do. Now, in my chat with Larry today, you'll discover how human emotions drive the market and why it's so important to look beyond price charts and indicators to understand what's moving the market. We also discuss how we can leverage extremes in specific human emotions to create quantifiable and profitable edges. Larry also shares how he came up with the idea of his new book, Buy the Fear, Sell the Greed, and what traders can learn from it. We also talk about three simple indicators to quickly judge the mood of the market, how Warren Buffett's investment approach to be fearful when others are greedy and greedy when others are fearful can also apply to short-term trading. And also, yes, I'm going to ask Larry about that famous Stops Hurt chapter published, I think, over 10 years ago now that still has people talking today. Plus, we'll cover a whole lot more. So let's jump over now to my chat with Larry Connors. Hi, Larry. Welcome to the show. It's really great to have you here. Thank you, Andrew. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Well, I'm sure many traders who listen to this show have probably purchased a number of books that you've released over the years and are aware of the research that you've published, but um, perhaps so many don't really know that your background. So can we just start first with a little bit about how you got started in the markets? Sure. Um, pro- probably like everyone else, I, I got started at a fairly young age. Um, my grandfather, when I was eight years old, um, bought me a couple of stocks, one of them being Exxon at the time. So I, re- I remember checking the newspaper every day to see what, to see what they did. Um, but, but ultimately, um, once I went off to college, I was running, um, while I was going to school, I was also working and running another business and, um, used some of the money to begin trading in the markets. And from there, um, when I finished with school, I went to work for Merrill Lynch. Um, at the time it was in um, early 1982. Um, I believe the Dow was somewhere around 700 or so. <laughs> found its way into into I believe the 600s, and then in August '82, um, markets took off all over, began lowering interest rates in the United States, and that was the beginning of just um, one great run here for for the markets as a whole, not only in the U.S. but for you know for many countries with there. Um, but you know, I've pretty much been able to see um, a lot of markets, um, been able to see what bull markets look like, um, what a few bear markets look like. And um, as, as much as things tend to change, you see a lot of things that stay the same. A lot of things that you know we saw back in the 80s and 90s, we still can see, continue to see here in, in 2018. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, yeah, I'm sure you've seen a lot of um, different kinds of uh, things in the markets. I think we're going to look at some of that a little bit later today. But if we, um, if you fast forward to now, can you kind of um, give us a bit of an indication of what kind of markets and timeframes and trading styles you like to focus on or ones that interest you? Sure. So there's um, a primary focus is really um, on a swing trading basis. It's it's a three to five day um, window in there. Um, a number of strategies, quantified strategies that we've created over the years um, tend to find that sweet spot. That's where markets tend to be um, mean reverting. And when I'm talking about um, markets as a whole, I'm, I'm really 
meaning equity markets, especially U.S. equity markets, um, they'll tend to have they'll tend to have these the short term pullbacks um, where historical ledges have existed, and then buyers come back in. Um, markets will go back to normal, and that's where we're looking to um, if a position um, was back up. That's where we're looking to exit the positions. Um, we also have some strategies that are a little bit longer term. Um, they tend to be more trend following. They tend to be more um, following where larger institutional money is going. But on a day-to-day basis um, over the years, the, the primary focus of what we've um, published has been that mean reversion trading. Yeah. And, and people who've um, studied your work would know that your research is very quantifiable, very quantified. What kind of drew you towards the uh, quantifying market edges? Well, we used to, um, and this, this, this dates it, but we, we, we used to go back and, and run a lot of our tests by hand. This is, this is before we had the ability to, to go in and, and um, do things um, with some of the software that's available today. Um, but at, at the end of the day, we, you know, I could see pretty much early on that, you know, my opinion was, you know, probably no better than anyone else's opinion. And, you know, during... You know, especially early on when we're talking about in the 80s and the 90s, you know, we're really not competing at the time against retail customers. We're, we're competing and trading against other professionals. Um, and you could begin seeing that price very much reflected consensus of what was in the marketplace. So we needed to begin a process of being able to identify times where markets were overbought, oversold, where there are historical edges um, that, that our opinion meant less. What, what meant more was the statistical evidence, whether or not there were edges in place and, you know, could, could they be taken advantage of? Yeah. Now, um, I, I did mention, um, or people have probably um, read a number of your books, and um, one of the reasons why we're chatting today is because you've just released a new book called Buy the Fear, Sell the Greed. And um, when I heard the title of the book, it, it kind of reminded me of something Warren Buffett said, or perhaps it's his philosophy of, um, you know, be fearful when others are greedy and greedy when others are fearful. Uh, so the book sounds a little bit like that. Can you can you share with us a little bit of a high-level overview of what the book is actually about? Yeah, that's exactly what you said. In fact, Buffett is, met, Buffett is mentioned in Chapter 1, and I finished the book with with basically referring back to Buffett. Um, there, there was there – was, originally when, when I began writing the book, there was no intention to do a comparison to Buffett. Um, but as we started going forward and as, as the writing um, ended up coming about, you end up seeing that on a much shorter um, term basis that it, do, it does um, begin to reflect the philosophy that Buffett's been preaching for for decades. Um, and if you take a look at the history of what Buffett has done on the investing side, um, he's very much been, been taking advantage of times when fear has been at the greatest. Um, that's where he's able to get the best pricing. Um, you take a look at, for example, in 2008 and 2009, when he was able to invest, for example, in, in Goldman Sachs, pretty much near, near the market bottom. These, these are, um, this is a repeatable pattern. You, you'll see where not only on a, on a longer term basis, but also on a shorter term basis, that fear will come into the marketplace, prices will pull back. And then ultimately, when that fear passes, uh, that's the times where those edges will tend to, to disappear. When the fear comes in, that's where the edges do appear. Not not only in, you know in in Warren Buffett's case, looking at it on a longer term basis, but we've been able to quantify it on a, on a very short term basis. So I think this is um, probably well the first and only book ever written that um, does quantify short term behavioral uh, finance. W- where did you come up with this idea? Uh, why did you why did you decide that you'd publish the book? Yes, well. For, for many years, we, we very much relied upon um, price and indicators, and, 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 and basically that became the guide point. Um, we began publishing on, on some of these things, and I mentioned this in the book, um, where we started taking um, the original RSI, Wells Wilder's RSI. If you remember back, probably going up until about the, the time we originally put it out back in 2002 and 2003, Wilder's RSI had been around for almost three decades, and most software packages, most traders were using it as a 14-period RSI. We could never find any type of um, edges there. We didn't see, um, we just didn't see any type of statistical edges in place. Um, then we started looking at a shorter-term basis. We started looking at a four and a three and a two-period RSI, and it was a, a somewhat astounding to see that the behavior 
on a look back basis. So beginning in 2002, 2003, as we're looking back, the behavior in the S&P 500 and many stocks in the S&P 500 were beginning to, um, you could see a repeatable pattern by using that shorter RSI. Um, that still holds true today. But what we've learned since that time is that it's not the RSI that's basically giving the, the, the signal. The, the RSI is basically being used to measure it. But what is usually going on, Andrew, during that period of time is there's some sort of fear coming into the marketplace. Okay. Um, and, and that fear can be viewed a couple of different ways. Number one, there's an event going on. And number two, there's just a concern of an event that might be coming up. Okay. So what will happen is that buyers will, um, well, I'll take it on the sell side. What will happen is that selling will tend to accelerate. The buyers will step aside. If they're fearful, they tend to step aside. Um, and if they anticipate an event, they, they will also just step aside. They'll wait for that event to pass. Um, what they're doing is they're basically creating edges. And some of the shorter term RSIs will tend to identify um, those times. And, and that's what we publish throughout the book. Mm. Yeah, I think it's interesting to um, when you're looking at indicators and chart patterns to try and think about what's the underlying um, you know, behavior or psychology there that's actually driving that. And uh, I think we've seen some pretty excessive and sometimes violent moves in the markets. Traders are panicking and uh, it, it kind of almost starts to feed on itself and it can spread really quickly. So what's what's actually happening there from a human psychology or crowd behavior perspective? Um, I, I want to, because we, we did this on a, on a look back basis, um, you know, I, I view it as a couple of different times and, and how news was disseminated. And I mentioned this in the book. So if you take a look at, at how news was disseminated, for example, in the eighties and nineties, um, there were only a few news services that were out there that used to move the markets. Um, so the, the um, wall street journal news, for example, was, was one. Bloomberg got into the um, data business in the early 80s, but didn't get into the news business until the later um, 80s and didn't really gain much traction um, for a few years from there. there. There was no CNBC. There was, of course, at the time, no Internet. So there was so, no social media. Um, that has changed dramatically here. Um, and you could see this uh, if, if you watch, for example, do you, um, do you get, for example, CNBC International that like, comes out of Australia? So do you ever watch CNBC International in your hours? Uh, I don't watch it, no. Okay. So if, if you take a look at, at CNBC, for example, um, during U.S. market hours, you will see, you can pretty much see how much fear and greed is in the marketplace on a short-term basis. But what you'll also see is that the news will drive prices, okay? Um, any news that's going on during that period of time or any anticipation of news, um, will drive prices, but that extends itself. So what happens here at U.S. time, Eastern time, is you know they do their market wrap up from four to five, then from five to six they go to a show um, called Fast Money, and then Jim Cramer comes on with his show from six to seven o'clock. What, what's happening now is the dissemination of news is moving prices faster. Um, that rhythm, at least from what we've seen, has gotten quicker. The moves, as you just mentioned over there, tend to be a little bit more extreme when they do occur. Um, and then when they correct themselves, they tend to correct themselves even quicker. Um, but that news does travel much faster today than it did, did 20 or 30 years ago. What has not, not changed um, and what will likely never change is markets are still made up of human emotions. Okay, And th this has been true throughout time. Um, when, when fear comes into the marketplace, buyers back off, sellers will accelerate, um, they create liquidity holes which ultimately means that you know, prices will pull back. The event will pass. Hypothetically, the event will pass. It's safer to buy. But normally, when it's safer to buy, prices have already moved back in. The edge goes to the traders who are stepping in and taking advantage of the fact that there is fear in the marketplace. Mm. Yeah, and I guess as well, when you do have those um, types of overreactions, um, I think the difficult thing there is knowing is the timing and how do you know if it's a good time to jump in? Should you wait? Is there ever, is there even a good time to jump in? Uh, so when you were doing your research, what type of things did you actually look at to try and quantify these edges? Okay. So there's, there's three parts that number one in, in the, the first part is most important price is everything. So um, everything begins with the price and price reflects what, what is indicative of the marketplace. Um, the second part is, that 
I'm always looking at whether or not a, a stock and, and especially, let's say, uh, an index, an equity index, is in an uptrend or a downtrend. We've, we've published this for many, many years. Um, we use the 200-day simple moving average. We're not the only ones. If you take a look, for example, at Paul Tudor Jones, who's run one of the great um, large hedge funds for, for many decades, um, he, he mentions continuously it's a single best indicator um, to guide him. Um, we've seen this statistically. Ideally, um, one wants to be buying. It's better to be buying in a, in a bull market and in a longer-term uptrend um, than to try to pick bottoms after, some, after something is in a longer-term downtrend. So that 200-day moving average does make a difference. And then the final piece is basically using an RSI, whether we use a short-term RSI, meaning a two-period RSI, or a four-period RSI, or as Cesar Alvarez and I um, developed Connor's RSI. Um, what we're basically looking there is we're, we're looking to use that indicator to help guide us. Um, and that's that those indicators are help guiding us just how much fear is in the marketplace. Mm, yeah. So then if you're using these indicators to, um, I guess, to assess the longer term market conditions like bull and bear, how wide a variation do you see in these fear and greed behaviors comparing bull markets to bear markets? Um, in, in a... In a healthy bull market, what will happen is the fear will be alleviated pretty quickly. Um, so what will happen is that the, the good news will tend to come back and, and, and tend to take prices higher. Um, and again, we're, we're talking on averages here. Um, in, in a beer market, the opposite is true. What will happen is that um, selling will overwhelm buying. And, and good news is usually often met with even more selling. Um, the only time that, uh, one of the few times that that's not true is when they make those violent bottoms. So if you take a look at some of the major bottoms that have been in place, for example, if you go back and you take a look, um, in late, um, I'm sorry, in early 2009, where the, um, markets bottom out, those were pretty violent bottoms that are there. The, the other part is that when, when stocks and when, um, equity indexes are above the 200 day, they tend to be less volatile. Um, things tend to be more quiet. That's more normal. Um, below the 200 day, we, we've been able to um, quantify this so, um, a number of different ways. Markets as a whole just become more erratic. Volatility increases, and it certainly becomes a more dangerous place to be buying if one is looking to do short-term trading. Um, when you know when when those stocks or when these ETFs are below the 200 day moving average. So the the, um, the indicators you just mentioned um, to measure this or quantify this type of edges, uh, you've mentioned indicators and price. But what about um, alternative data or additional data sets like we've got sentiment indicators and um, you know, social media kinds of indicators that have, have become the rage over the last few years? Do those kind of things, can they also um, provide some kind of edge when you're trying to quantify the fear and the greed? Um, they can. I've seen... When you're talking about social media, I know I'm, I'm familiar with some of the data that's out there. Um, we've created our own um, data along the way with, with try, uh, trying to measure with, with sentiment on a social media basis. Um, it gets to be fairly sophisticated, okay? There's, um, there's, there's a lot of games that can get played um, with the information that comes through, um, with the data that comes with social media. And I would just caution that... Um, it, that's a moving target over there. And, you know, wh whether, whether or not anyone has the ability to, um, you know, to, to, to be able to go in and quantify it, that's usually being done by some of the hedge funds that have higher level um, math and computational abilities. We're, we're talking about some of the larger quant funds. Um, and even, even they are dealing with, you know, issues as they move forward with that. Yeah. Um, so you just mentioned the U.S. markets there. Um, now, uh, you also said that, you know, this fear and greed is driven by human emotion and humans trade all types of markets. So, um, but some markets, I guess, are more developed than others, like uh, the U.S. is quite a, a developed market, but perhaps um, there's other markets that aren't quite that um, enhanced or advanced. But do you see these type of behaviors differ between different markets as well? Yeah, that's a good question. We don't. So what we've done is we, we've um, we've looked at U.S. based ETFs that are basically low for for example country funds. So we've looked at, at countries from around the world um, that had liquid ETFs here in the United States, and you will see a repeatable pattern over there of the fear of greed with there. 
Um, it's somewhat fascinating to me because it's, um, it, it's, you know, we're, we're talking about di- different parts of the world. Um, and yet the same emotions still come in, um, and play a role. Um, when we did some of our testing, for example, in one of the first chapters in the book was in the RSI power zones. Uh, we were seeing results in country funds, and I, I believe we looked at over 20 different country funds, which were basically um, in line with each other. Um, nothing nothing reverts better than the U.S. markets, reverts to the mean better than the U.S. markets, especially the S&P 500, at least in anything that we've seen. Um, but with that being said, most countries tend to behave the same, the same that overbought and oversold as it's coming in from the fear, you know, coming in with the fear that will come into the marketplace, then the fear subsides, they'll take prices higher. And that becomes especially about the 200 day moving average. That's a repeatable pattern we've seen over and over again. And you, you, you know, as you see from the book, that's been, that's been quantified going back many years. Yeah. Yeah. I think this, um, this type of trading can be psychologically hard as well at times. Um, mean reversion trading, especially in times of fear when you have these overreactions and increases in volatility and things, it can almost feel like you're trading against the rest of the world, you know, especially in these times of market stress. Um, so perhaps this type of trading could be difficult for some traders. What, what type of traders do you think would suit these styles of trading? Yeah, you, you bring up a great point um, because those prices are there for a reason. It's usually created by the fear that's out there. That fear is being induced, you know, especially by the media, and now it's turned from into social media combined. Um, a systematic trader who does not have to push the button so everything is automated um, has less of a problem pulling the trigger. And for example, someone who's sitting in front of the screen and has CNBC or Bloomberg or one of the other networks there um, talking about all the craziness that might be out there. So, you know, certainly a systematic trader, someone who has this automated um, and doing it on a systematic basis. And that's what the historical test results are based upon. It's it's based upon, um, you know, simulate it's simulating a systematic buy and sell along the way. Um, Those traders as a whole tend to do better. With these type of trading, than someone who um, look we're all human. We're all we're all um, susceptible to the uh, the news that's out there. And if one doesn't have to listen to it, then one has an advantage. Certainly has a big advantage. Yeah, yeah. As you know, we've had Cesar Alvarez on the show a couple of times, and um, one of the points he makes um, sometimes it's best not to look at the chart. Just take the trade and trust in the system. I think that. Um, kind of applies in this case as well. But for traders who aren't really sure if they can trade um, these styles, how do you think they should approach it? Well, well, number one, I think with any type of trading or any endeavor in life, you have to have a commitment. So if, if um, this is probably not something that you can just um, put your toe into, you have to basically say, I'm going to do it or, or I'm not going to do it. Hmm. Um, but with that being said, I, I think the, the overriding thing is, is um, what type of risk management is in place um, here in the U.S. We have um, we have pretty deep and liquid options markets, and options basically, um, if they use correctly, basically allow you to predetermine what the dollar risk is. Um, whereas, you know, for example, you know, a- anybody who has positions in equities or in ETFs, um, whether it's long or short, or let's just talk about on the long side. Um, there's essentially open-ended risk. The risk is the money that you've placed into the position. Um, people, I, I you know, f- believe that stops protect them. Um, we have published this in, in a, um, a previous book that Cesar and I wrote together yeah. um, that, that stops. We show statistically that, that stops as a whole um, really don't help. They tend to hurt performance. Um, there's a combination of two things. One, um, the number of times things get whipped so they get stopped out. A number of times those losses begin to add up. And number two, if something crazy in the world occurs while markets are closed, there is, um, you know, there's nothing that can be done. Um, Those stops don't come into place. And, you know, I've lived through this. I saw that in the 87 crash. Um, We saw it, you know, for example, after 9-11. And on individual stocks, it happens all the time. So someone may think that they're protected. They'll buy a stock, for example, at, let's say, $40 a share, and they may say, okay, I'm going to risk 10%. I'm going to have a stop in at 36 It doesn't help them if the stock opens up the next day at 18 
So um, a, a better way, at least in my opinion, is, is to basically be able to put those positions on using using options um, and you know looking to basically replicate as close as possible what the what the underlying stock or ETF is doing. And so what we're basically talking about is deep in the money options. And uh, just a little bit more on this fear before we move on. So um, with more um, algorithms or algos stepping into the market, do you think, uh, what kind of impact do you think that could have on these fear and greed behaviors over time? So the algorithms have been around probably longer than most people are aware. The algorithms began coming around in in, in the 90s. So they've, they've been around quite some time. What doesn't change is the human emotion in a, in a night. I open up the book with with a quote from um, General from George Patton. Um, Patton Patton had this quote which he wrote, I believe it was in 1926, so he's a major back then, where he basically said that the emotions um, felt by um, you know people in the military today are the same emotions felt by the warriors from centuries before, and there's a truism to that. That you know if you think you you go back and you look back through history, um, fear is inherent. Fear and greed is inherent, but especially fear is inherent in human beings. Um, it's not going to change. Algorithms are not going to change that. Um, and all, all you have to do is just you know, watch the news during the day and just they'll, they'll put a little bit of news out there. Um, you see how, how fear comes into the marketplaces and prices will react to that. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I just want to ask you about this, um, about the Stops Hurt chapter that you published um, I think it was in the short-term trading strategies that work. Um, yes. Now, it was published quite a while ago. I'm not sure of the date, maybe 10 years ago, yes. something like that. Now, that created quite a firestorm at the time, and, I mean, people are still talking about it today. So it's yeah. had quite a, a big impact on the trading community. Did you realize that it would um, you know, have that kind of impact? No, no, no. <laughs> I'm, I'm smiling as you, as you say that because it's uh, it, it's a single chapter. I, and I, I mentioned in the book, it, it's... it's if stops work for someone, continue to use them. Um, mm. they're, they're in place, and you know, with, with that being said, we we have um, we we have strategies that do have stops in place. I think you know it has to be an understanding though that the stops have limitations to them, and I think they they underestimate what the um, you know I, I think traders underestimate they, they they may they may they may give them some false belief that they're completely protected when they're not. But um, we stand by that research. That research continues to hold up. We've seen that research replicated by many others over the years um, who've come to the same conclusion. And this is where it stands here today on, on a net basis, especially with the mean reversion trading. Um, stops do hurt. They potentially, though, um, it could potentially be done with a better way. And again, in my opinion, options are one of the ways that potentially can make it better. Now, you've actually published quite a number of books, I think maybe about 20 or more uh, to date, and you know many of them have either become classics or are on their way to becoming classics. Um, you did Street Smarts with Linda Rashke. Um, you did Short Term Trading Strategies, How Markets Really Work, a lot of stuff with Cesar. Um, do you have a um, do you have a favorite or something that you're most proud of that has uh, had the biggest impact on the trading community? Um, well, Street Smarts, Street Smarts was was uh, was. Fun. It was fun to 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 write that book with Linda, um, and I, you know, we we brought we brought at the time, you know, especially on Linda's side. Um, I, I think at at that time a lot of people um, were were waiting for Linda to put something there, put mm-hmm. something in writing like that, um, and you know that that book has um, is has you know remains a, a, a fun place in my heart. Um, short-term trading strategies that work um, certainly has continued to, um, you know, it somewhat surprised me in a good way that it, it just continues to find a home out there. Um, I think, um, you know, this is, you know, hopefully an advancement of my own research, an advancement of my own growth. Um, this book by the Fair Sell the Greed is, is, in my opinion, the best one that I've, I've put out there. I mean, that takes nothing away from anything that, that's that's been previously published. Mm. But as we move ahead, um We've grown. We've become smarter, and it, it's it's um, the information in this book. A lot of that information in the book um, is value added. It's things that when you get into a day to day aspects of trading, um, there's wisdom in that book that I, I couldn't have written ten years ago. 
Yeah. I think um, that was probably a little bit of an unfair question. It's kind of like asking a parent to pick their favourite child. So <laughs> <laughs> apologies for that. <laughs> but you gave yeah. a good answer. So, yeah, thanks for explaining that. Thanks. Okay, now I just want to start wrapping up with a couple of quick closing questions. Yes. Okay, so what's the biggest lesson you've learned through trading? Um, there's a lot of lessons. N- number one is risk management is is single most important thing that's out there. Um, because the, you, you can't, one can't spend enough time on, on risk management and trying to get better on risk management. Um, n- number two is that when you when when you start believing that you're smarter than the markets. Um, it's usually a sign that you know one's going to get humbled pretty quickly. Um, it's only a matter of time. Lynn, Lynn and I were just having a conversation, and um, we were emailing each other. And she she told me that she um, may be bringing up a, a book, and it's basically not a book on trading strategies, but it's a book on all the all, all the times that um, it was more focused on the losing trades. And I, I got to tell you, Andrew, it was funny when she sent it. It was interesting that when she sent that to me, because I can't remember um, many of the winning trades, but I can tell you the losing trades. Um, and, you know, many of them are at historical times, you know, being on the other side of the Deutschmark when the um, Berlin Wall came down um, during Desert Storm. I was short. Bo- I was short bonds and oil heading into Desert Storm. 9-11, I was on the other side. I was along the S&Ps. We had signals them, um, that Monday night before, the evening before, that Monday night before. Those are the ones I remember. Um, and, and after that, I, I remember that I, that I was short the market um, heading into the 87 crash. But it took me a while to remember that. Um, one tends to remember the losing trades better. And, um, and if you spend too much time dwelling on the winners, I don't think you grow. You really do grow from the times when, when, you know, when those losses do occur. Yeah, that's some great advice there. Thanks, Larry. Um, now, what about uh, the best trading advice you've ever received? I've got to th- I have to think that one. I've got a lot. Of, I've been very fortunate. I, I've, I've been very fortunate. I've, I've got a lot of friends um, in the industry, uh, and it's probably a culmination. It's a it's a culmination of, of, of many of them. Um, and, and there's also it, it's also a culmination. I you know I I like to. I do a lot of reading. I re- read a lot of trading books. There's a lot of great books that are out there. Um, I think that you know one of the one of the people that has done the best job in compiling some of the best information out there is Jack Schwager in his Market Wizards books, and Linda was in New Market Wizards. And I think you know the one that probably is the most underrated, and the one that maybe I've gotten some of the some of the better information from o- over the past um, let's say five years is the book that he wrote, Hedge Fund Market Wizards. I, I thought, um, you know, I know many of the, the, the traders in, in the first three books. Um, they were all very, it was all very informative. Hedge fund market wizards to me was this gold in that book. Mm-hmm. And um, it didn't seem to get the same type of, um, it didn't seem to get the same type of interest as the other books go, went. But if I had to start any place, um, or if anyone said, you know, what, can you can you give me a good compilation? I, I'd say go, go with hedge fund market wizards. There's gold in that book. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Larry. Now, what's the best way for listeners to learn more from you? Where can they go? Um, well, they can come onto the Trading Markets website. I put out yep. um, research two times, approximately two times a week. Um, we're currently doing a series now that is talking about um, 10 ways to improve your trading. Um, they're going to move it into a volatility series on volatility trading. So if they come up to the Trading Markets website, they can sign up. Um, anyone who's listening to this can sign up for a free newsletter. Um, just put in your email address and get that. And then uh, obviously the, the books are available um, on the Trading Markets website. The books are also available um, on Amazon. Buy the Fair Sell the Grid is not available yet on Amazon, um, but you have the URL, Andrew. I think you can share that with everyone. Yep, absolutely. So I'll have a link to that on the show notes page so that people can get access before it comes out on Amazon. So thanks for sharing that, Larry. Yes, thank you. Awesome. So uh, thanks a lot for your time today. I really enjoyed chatting to you. Is there anything else that you want to mention before we uh, before we wrap this up? Well, it's really good. I mean, it's it's a great service that you provide with with your site. I mean, the culmination is there's, there's a lot of knowledge on this site. So uh, yep. probably a message to anyone who's listening. There's there's um, there's great information. You've, you've had some great speakers here on the site. And uh, thank you. you know, thank you for providing this for all of us.
Oh, thanks, Larry. Well, uh, thank you for uh, joining the long list of exceptional guests. We've been very lucky to have some amazing uh, people on their show. So thank you for, um, yes, for spending time with us today and sharing some of your valuable insights. And uh, I wish you all the best. You're welcome. You too, Andrew. Thank you again. Thanks, Larry. Cheers. Okay, well, that's it for this episode. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the show. Come on over to bettersystemtrader.com. That's where you'll find all the previous episodes, all the transcribes, all the show notes, and all the free weekly trading tips. bettersystemtrader.com. Bettersystemtrader.com.